the presentation uh, for today is going to be mostly focused about learning how to help with errors that arise while creating an FSA ID. And thank you for submitting your questions as well with the event registration. We have a lot to cover today. Uh, most of the allocated time that we have for today is going to be used for the presentation. So if you have any questions while the presentation is going on, please drop them in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. As well as if you're feeling overwhelmed with information at all, uh, we will be posting this on YouTube later and you can have access to it there. You can pause it, play it back, uh, whatever you, you need to do. Um, so my name is Christian Simonson. I'm a federal work study aide with the Utah System of Higher Education. Uh, this past fall, I attended 13 FAFSA night events and a large portion of my job is dedicated to researching and helping with others with issues related to the FAFSA as well as the FSA ID. I'm also joined by two guest speakers. Uh, first, we have Kylie Stoddard. Kylie, if you'd want to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Kylie. Um, I'm a UPAC advisor, so college um, access advisor at Green Canyon High School in Cache Valley. Um, and I just have the opportunity to help most of my seniors and students with the FAFSA form. So I have a little bit of experience. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and we're, we're grateful that Kylie has come with UCAC. Uh, their organi the UCAC organization as a whole had 47 volunteers this past fall with, uh, with the FAFSA night events and 101 total attendance at the events. So um, we're, we're very thankful to have Kylie here representing UCAC. Uh, I'm also joined by Merrill Worthington. Merrill, if you'd want to introduce yourself. Hi, guys. I'm Merrill Worthington. I'm a financial advisor at Snow College. Worked here for about 10 years. Um, done FAFSA nights for several years. We try to get the six county in central Utah. And so see lots of different students throughout the year. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And, and, as well as Merrill attended 12 FAFSA night events himself. So we appreciated that. And the SNOW team attended, it th had 36 total event attendances at FAFSA night events. So we're grateful for Merrill and also his organization and what they do. So first we just wanted to start off with a little bit, uh, just some data from the events. So we had a post event survey and over a thousand students have filled out the survey to date. And 73.71% of those students said that they were able to complete the FAFSA. And most of them, most of the students filling it out, filled it out immediately after the event. So this shows that the events are working and that a lot of the students that are attending the events are able to complete the FAFSA. And those that aren't able to complete it, they're able to make good progress and figure out what, what areas they still need to get done so that they can complete it. And as of right now, 21.3% of high school seniors have completed the FAFSA in Utah, which is awesome. We're projecting 37 to 38%, which is up from last year. So thank you everyone with uh, your work to help students with that. Okay. And then for the presentation today, we are going to, we, we want participation from everyone. And we're going to be having a few practices using uh, this Poll Everywhere software. Uh, it's similar to Kahoot, if uh, anyone's familiar with that. I know when I was in school, we used that a lot in the classroom. Um, so all you'll do is you'll go to pollev.com. We'll also be putting a link in the chat. And then you'll enter this code, U-S-H-E, access, one, two, three. So we'll give everyone a minute to get that put in. Okay, and then while everyone's putting that in, I'm going to go ahead on to our first scenario, practice scenario. I'm going to read this out loud, but feel free to start putting your answers into it. So the scenario is a high school senior's parent is creating their FSA ID. 
they got an error message saying that their social security number was already associated with an account. They mentioned that when they went to college decades ago, they had used aid for college. What should we do? So the options are A, register an account with all zeros. B, or all zeros as the social security number. B, delete their old account and make a new one. C, try to retrieve username and reset password. If that doesn't work, call the FSA Information Center. And D, have their spouse create an account instead. All right. Looks like everyone's getting that question for right. So the, the correct answer is to try and retrieve the username and reset password. And then you can also call the FSA Information Center uh, and they can help with the retrieval process. Although having a spouse create it is a solution, it can cause problems later on. And you know, it's it's recommended that so that they should try to retrieve their accounts so that they have access to it. So this is the kind of error message that pops up if uh, if someone's trying to register an account and they may not realize that they already have an account uh, created. Uh, with that scenario that we just had, or maybe they had a, another student that went to school years ago and they forgot that they had already created an account. So it can be a little bit confusing when it pops up. So if their social security is already in use, that just means that they already have an account and they need to go in and retrieve it. So we have some instructions here on the, on the account retrieval process. I've highlighted here where they click on the login screen to go if they forgot their username or password. And then once they click on that, they'll either have to put in their email or phone number and then the date, their date of birth to retrieve it. Uh, and they should also be aware that if the password is put in incorrectly uh, three times, it the account will lock and they'll have to retrieve it with their phone number or by ending entering an email code. And there's also the challenge questions that are created when they first register the account. Uh, if someone no longer has access to their phone number or email, they can call the, the FSA Information Center. Uh, their hours are right here as well as the phone number is right here as well. Okay, some more common errors that we saw frequently occur at the events. Uh, the, we had a common one where the account doesn't exist error message where someone would register an account and then they would go and try to log into it and it would say their account doesn't exist. They would go back and try to create the account and it said that their account already existed. So it takes a few minutes to synchronize with the FAFSA servers. Uh, solutions for this is clearing the cache and waiting a few minutes for it to clear up or they could also try switching browsers. A lot of people have had success with that as well. And then another thing to note is that there is an invisible timer with the FSA ID registration. Uh, if a parent's helping a student and they're idle on the page while they're in the middle of the FSA ID registration, they don't receive any notification or anything about this, but if they're idle on the page for too long, the page will automatically close it out of itself and they'll have to start all over with creating their FSA ID. And then, uh, Kylie, I know that as we were talking, you said that you had some experience with this. How did you go about like helping families with common errors like this and in these situations? Yeah, I think sometimes uh, the school internet system just in general isn't great, especially at large FAFSA events. So telling parents to maybe, and students, jump off the school Wi-Fi on their phones if they're trying to retrieve um, an email code or a verification code via text message, um, step outside the building for a little bit. We had a lot of individuals do that, and then they finally got their code. Um, and a lot of times, uh, it just wasn't working for the student in that moment because I don't know. So I would just tell the student, you know what, let's give it a day and I'll pull you out of class. And then tomorrow for some weird reason, it would end up working. But kind of as you said, also trying a different web browser seemed to fix most problems. Okay, for sure, yeah, awesome, thank you. Yeah, no, those, those issues can be really tricky and and like Kylie said sometimes the best thing is just trying an alternate route and if that doesn't work just 
waiting and, and seeing if, you know, even if, if a different day will work better. I think that's awesome. So this is usually what pops up after the visible timer. Sometimes it doesn't appear. And like we were said, it doesn't give a notification. But if they have the window open, this is kind of like the timer that would show up. But if the window's closed, like if it's on a different tab, then they won't be able to see this at all. And it'll close out without letting them know. And now we want to talk a bit about a magic trick that we have for, com com uh, for helping with a lot of these really common errors, clearing the cache and cookies. So we are showing an example on Google Chrome. Uh, Google Chrome is what we recommend for completing the FAFSA. Uh, and we have, we have some instructions on how to clear the cache. So first, what you're going to do is you're going to click on the little three dots in the top corner of the web browser. And then once you do that, you're going to want to go down to where it says settings, almost towards the bottom of that little pop-up pop tab. And then you're going to click on settings. And then on the third option down, you're going to go to privacy and security. And then once you click on privacy and security, you're going to click on that top option, which says clear browsing data. And then once you click on that, you're going to check the two boxes that say download history and cookies and other site data. So this will kind of just, it's almost like a reset for the browser, just uh, clears all downloaded data, allows it to kind of refresh and, and make, and it's kind of like a, a reboot for the web browser. So yeah, so once you select those, you will just click clear data and then you're all set. Okay, another uh, thing that's important to make note of is that sometimes the FAFSA website will be down for maintenance and other things like that. Uh, we recommend checking their website and the, under the FAFSA announcements. If you scroll down on their webpage a little bit, it shows about planned outages and other important announcements that they're trying to make available. Um, Meryl, I know you said that you had some experience with outages. I don't know if you would mind uh, talking kind of like how you went about like in that situation, ha helping people and what you would recommend. Yeah, so we had uh, a fast night in Fillmore um, and we got down there and just started. And at six o'clock, the, the basketball website went down. Um, we did not see any planned outages there, so we couldn't plan ahead, um, but it did just go down. So essentially, we just kind of talked to the ones who were there and just uh, told them we'd come back down. So we got a time rescheduled and went back down to them. It was like an hour and a half drive, but uh, but we still went back down and it just uh, it was frustrating for everyone, but there's not much we can do. So put a smile on your face and get going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and at the at the end of the day, you know, sometimes there can be unplanned outages, things like that. And like Meryl said, that's the best you can do is just reschedule, try again. And, and yeah. All right. So that covers most of our, our common errors. Kylie and Meryl, I don't know if y'all had anything else you wanted to add to that. What's been said so far? Okay. All right. So now we're going to go move on to a little bit of uncommon errors. So the first one is the verification code not sending. And Kylie touched a little bit on this as well. Uh, the, the FAFSA website is good, uh, and the FAFSA system is good about sending out those codes to either text message or email. Often when there's an error with it, it's, it's related to the user side. So it's good to check to see if it's in the spam folder and make sure that they have a strong internet connection. And there is an option to resend the code as well. But it's really important that they should when given this option, someone should avoid spam clicking the button, because if they spam click the button and it's just taking a while for them to receive that message, then they're going to have to wait until the very last message is received. So it could end up causing a bigger issue for them. And like Kylie said, they can step outside the building, see if they have better cell service and different things like that. Uh, another one that's that's uh, can be a really... Uh, annoying issue to deal with would be accidentally putting in the wrong information or uh, either putting the wrong information or phone number or a lot of people had a situation where maybe they just got a new phone number and it was already registered with an account so they're having trouble uh, getting into their account because they can't verify it. So the best thing to do to get that fixed is to call the Federal Student Aid Information Center 
Uh, there's the phone number again, as well as the hours of operation, and they can help get that corrected. And then one other uncommon issue that is that can pop up is if someone has two last names or a name that exceeds the character limit. Uh, if they're typing it out and then all of a sudden it just stops, like their last name is a bit too long for the character limit on the FAFSA, uh, they should just leave it as is. And then with hyphens and characters and things like that, just try to match what they, they should just try to match whatever they have on their social security card for verification purposes. Yeah, and then Kylie or Mara, I don't know if either of y'all had anything to add to that section right there. Oh. The one thing I would mention on there, um, one or two of the schools does not have very good cell phones and service that we went to. Um, one thing I'd suggest too is before you have the event, make sure you talk to your IT people so they can have the guest uh, um, guest Wi-Fi so students can get on there, parents can get on there in case they don't actually have uh, cell phone service. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, that that is a very good idea. It's always good to to plan ahead uh, for for situations that could occur like that. Thank you. All right. So now we have our second scenario. Uh, same thing. I'm going to read it out loud, but feel free to start putting answers in. So during a FAFSA night event, you assist a parent creating their FSA ID and there's an error stating that the phone number is already in use in another account. The student mentions they use their parents' phone number to create the FSA ID earlier in class. So what should they do? What should they do to fix this? So they could either A, have the parent put in the phone number of the student or their spouse. B, have the student try to edit their phone number if they don't have if they have one in their account. If that doesn't work, to call the FSA Information Center. And C, don't insert the phone number at all in the parent's account and leave everything as is. Okay, awesome job. Looks like everyone everyone's getting that right. So yeah, although, because I saw that, that the top one was highlighted for a little bit, um, everyone got that right, so nice job. Um, although they could put in their spouse's phone number, that can create ish, that can create problems in the long run. Like if the student in the future uh, wants to fill out their FAFSA, they're already in school, and they have to verify the phone number in order to get into their account, then they're going to have to call up mom and dad or or whatever whoever they're putting in as their parent on the FAFSA, and they'll have to get that get that fixed. So the best option would be to try to fed it, to edit their phone number immediately in their account. And then, you know, if there's issues with that, call the FSA Information Center. Okay. And then one thing to make everyone aware of as well is because uh, although it's taken down now and it's not on the website, uh, while it's being challenged in the courts, the debt forgiveness application was the first thing to pop up on the federal student aid website. So it would be a good idea to just go and double check with students and make sure they didn't accidentally fill out this form when they were trying to fill out the FAFSA, because as you can see, there's a start at the application button. And then if it does end up popping up again, make sure that you're aware that uh, students don't accidentally fill out this form instead of what they're trying to do. Uh, we also uh, want to talk a little bit about the IRS data retrieval tool um, with that's within the FAFSA. A lot of people had issues with that and trying to enter data. Uh, to make to ensure success with this, uh, the best thing that they can do is make sure everything matches how it is on their tax forms. So, for example, if on their tax form it said maybe they live on an address that has 500 South, but on their tax form it says 500 S, they would need to put that 500 S in order for it to go in correctly. And also parents should double check that their birthday is entered correctly. And it's also important they check uh, who they had down for parent one and parent two, and that that lines up with the, the FAFSA information as well. And then Kylie and Meryl, I don't know if either of y'all had anything that you wanted to add to that section or any of the other errors we talked about. I was just going to mention there that uh, the data retrieval has gotten a lot better the last couple of years. Um, this year, I think it's high 90%. It's probably the data retrievals at work 
Um, but I even had a few that we sat down with the taxes, double check, make sure everything's right. It still didn't go. So don't get lose patience. Just it still isn't perfect on there for you. Like tech, any technology there, but it's at least worth giving it a try. No, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, it totally is worth giving it a try because like if if they can use the data retrieval tool and it works well for them, it makes the FAFSA process so much easier because they don't have to input all that tax information manually. All right. So another thing that we want to talk a little about is other useful features that we have uh, within the computer to make things easier on, on families. So one thing they can do on a Windows computer, if you press the Windows and U key, it brings up a display setting where you can, the very first option is to, you can make uh, the text size bigger uh, if they're having a little bit of trouble reading the text that's on the computer. Another thing that I noticed a lot at, as I attended FAFSA night events is there were a lot of families that uh, had a Spanish speaking parent, but they were filling out the FAFSA form and creating their FSA ID uh, and I don't think they realized that they could switch the language into Spanish. So they were having to have their student translate everything for them. So if they just go to the top of the web page in the, in the corner, they can switch the language into Spanish and it makes it a lot easier for them. So just make sure that your families as they're attending events and as they're filling out the FAFSA, that they're aware that they can do that. And then with the creating the FSA ID, as well as on the FAFSA, next to uh, most uh, fill in the blank boxes, there's a little question mark that gives an explanation on what it's asking for there and in, in the case of like tax information and things like that it'll actually show images of what it looks like and where you can find it exactly so it's super useful as well and then another thing that we wanted to talk about briefly is because the fat creating the fsa id and filling out the fafsa they can be really frustrating uh processes and could be really uh difficult for families especially after like They've been working all day and then they have to go and do this with their student. Um, and Kylie and Meryl, how would y'all say that you deal with frustrated parents and uh, frustrated families as they were trying to complete this? Um, I guess for me, when I've had parents that have been really frustrated in the system or something isn't working, just expressing that I'm on the parent side and I'm on their team, and I want to do everything in my power to help them and their student get FAFSA done so they have the opportunity for scholarships or to be able to receive a federal Pell Grant, excuse me, if they do qualify. Um, just expressing that I'm also frustrated with them and that I want to help them, um, that I'm on their team. It helps um, parents want to come back to get things situated and finalized with their FAFSA with me instead of just kind of being like, well, too bad, maybe next time, just reaching out to constantly, like emailing that next day and saying, hey, I'm so sorry, you know, we weren't able to finish everything yesterday. When can we do it again? I wanna be of help. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's awesome. Thank you for that. And also my opinion, I kind of think the, there's kind of some misconceptions there because they talk to their neighbors and their friends and somebody might've had a problem with it, but, they haven't actually given it a try. So they come in with a grudge on their shoulders, say, oh, this is terrible, but they, they've never tried it. Um, just kind of reassure them that you're there and you know, just say, hey, it's, it's worth it there for you. Um, if you do the math, if uh, somebody's full pay eligible, there's not many jobs out there that pay us $6,000 to do an hour's worth of work. So you know, it's definitely worth to sit there with them and just let them know you're there to help them and they can, uh, you know, just let them know your hair there and it usually helps calm everything down. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, thank you both. That, those are very, very good information. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so now we have our third and final scenario uh, for y'all. So, um, okay, here we go. While meeting with a family to complete the FAFSA, you discover that the family had just moved from outside the country six weeks ago. Both parents have social security numbers. However, the student's social security number has not come in yet. What should we do? Uh, a, tell the student they don't qualify for aid that, and that they will have to pay for college on their own. B, have the parent create FSA IDs and fill out the FAFSA for the student, then have the student mail their signature. C, have the student call the FSA Information Center for help. 
And D, have the student wait until their paperwork is available and active before they create their FSA ID or FAFSA. Okay, it looks like most of our responses are in now. So this one was a little bit uh, of, tr of a tricky one. A little, we, we tried to uh, be a little bit tricky with some of the answers. So the, the correct answer is the last one, have the students wait until their paperwork is available and active before they create the FSA ID, FSA ID in, the, in this situation. Um, you can also refer them to uh, the university that they're planning on tending for additional financial aid as well beyond that while they're waiting. And it's also important to note that at the current time of this presentation, uh, because of the situation, Afghan and Ukrainian refugees are eligible for Title IV aid. They just haven't, um, many are still waiting on their social security information. Uh, they will just need to work with their the university that they're planning on attending directly to complete the FAFSA. So this top option, the or sorry, the second option, where having the parents create the FSA IDs, uh, and then having the uh, student mail the signature, uh, this doesn't quite work. So the student needs a social security number in order to uh, complete the FAFSA and, and be eligible for the federal financial aid. Um, the parents, if the if the parent does not have a social security number, the signature can be mailed. But the but if the student doesn't uh, the student cannot mail their signature the parent can but in in those situations but the student would need to have a social security number to sign for their, the FAFSA and then as well as calling the FSA information center they will probably just redirect you to uh, the similar options as given in option D where they'll just have to wait or uh, seek another route for financial aid. So this kind of just go, this slide kind of just goes over what we talked about a little bit just now. So, and as well as uh, this includes the students that are valid, that have a social security number valid through the Department of Homeland Security work authorization as shown by this image in the corner, this is what it looks like. So students without an SSN or that have a DHS work authorized SSN uh, are not eligible for Title IV aid. They can work with their college's financial aid office and dream center to seek after aid, though. And then, Merrill, if you don't mind me asking you really quick, what are what, what are some op options that are available at Snow College for for students that might be in the situation? Yes, yeah, so like you said, there's they're not eligible for any federal financial aid until they do get that Social Security number. Uh, but there are some uh, different alternatives like scholarships. Um, so our, our DECA students, um, they would be eligible for uh, academic scholarships. Um, but then all students, uh, regardless if they're a U.S. citizen or not, they're always eligible for a private and departmental scholarships. Um, and there's also some uh, international waivers through our uh, Center for Global Engagement also that might also be able to help as well. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so that's really, you know, so there there are options for for getting financial aid, as Merrill was, was stating, and there's a lot of good options as well. And then with the situation, if there is a student that has the so a student that has a social security number and their parent does not, uh, we recommend the parent uh, doesn't create an FSA ID and they put all zeros in the, as their social security number on the FAFSA form, and then they can mail that uh, mail their signature in to the federal student aid organization, and then the student can still have their FAFSA submitted. Christian, can I also make one mention on that too? Yeah. Um, also, if you, for the signature for like the parents, um, they can mail it in. Um, sometimes that can take weeks, um, but generally the school can have them sign a signature page on person, and then we can add on later, and, and we can get back with like in a few days. So especially when school gets closer and get you started, you kind of a time crunch, talk to a school instead of maybe mailing in that form, you get the stuff done a lot quicker on there for you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's really good. And you know, with now that a lot of students are registering for school, that can be a really good option as well. So 
Thank you for mentioning that. Then I don't know if anyone else had anything to add to, to this. Can I add to that as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I've, I actually have made this mistake um, with a particular student. We printed the form. Um, mom and dad didn't have a social security number, signed it, sent it off, but we didn't actually submit the form. So just making sure the form's actually submitted um, because first it allows you to print it and then it can be easy to just forget to submit the form and you think everything's going to be good once you mail it off. And then we got a letter saying that um, things didn't work out. So just making sure that things are submitted first. Oh, yes. Yeah, that is very important. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, because the when someone creates or starts their FAFSA form, it, that FAFSA form is open for 45 days. So, and and like uh, Meryl and Kylie were saying, the signature can take a little while to process. So it's just good to be careful with that, that it make sure that they submitted it and then mail the signature. Can I add something really quick? I actually yeah. got a phone call yesterday um, of a parent who had a, a social security number that was DHS authorized um, for work only purposes. And they actually were able to submit the FAFSA with it. So if you encounter this, please call me. Um, I'd like to see if there's any other cases that we're encountering with this. Uh, most likely it should be rejected by the Social Security Administration to check, but um, I'm curious if we're encountering that in, the other, in any other places. So, Also with that, it's possible it could go through, but that's rejected on the school side too once it comes mm -hmm. through to the school. That's good to know. Thank you, Meryl. Yeah. All right, well, unless anyone else has anything to add to that, that covers uh, the presentation portion of this. And then it looks like we have some questions in the chat. Um, let's see here. And I will say we are over on time. If you need to go, please feel free to do so. Um, but we're gonna take some time to answer any questions that may have come up. So um, thank you for those that need to take off. Um, we appreciate it, and you will be, have access to these questions after, but we do want to give some time to those questions if there are any before we end the session, so. Yeah, let's see. Um, I'm kind of looking through right now, Dylan. I don't know if you have any questions highlighted that haven't been attended to yet. Yeah, so one of them, I, I've answered most of them, but just so it's brought up to the group, um, for those that may have not seen the chat, uh, uh, one question that came in is how easy is it for the to get a hold of the student aid and information center by phone? Um, from my experience, uh, sometimes it's a wait. Um, I like to not wait longer than 20 minutes and I recall again because maybe someone else will answer. But um, I've heard of parents who have waited on there for 40 minutes or longer, just depending on the time of the year, especially during FAFSA season when it's you know October, November, usually they're pretty swamped. So um, Kylie or Meryl, if you have anything you'd like to add to that, feel free to do so. It's not just hard, just plan on some time. <laughs> That's the only thing I can say. And of course, you've got my phone number up on here to, to give me a call if you have any questions or you need any issues too. I did see the one question about is the W-2s go beyond the FAFSA next year? Um, so two things. One thing to mention on there for you is the formula. Um, we actually formula works is actually it's beneficial that actually both parents have income on wages. Um, so that's the one thing. That's why they have uh, have you enter that in. But next year the fast is going to be totally different. Um, I don't know if they even ask for wages next year because everything is going to look totally different than what we have in this year. So it's kind of a crapshoot. We have no idea what to even expect next year yet. Um, we had another question come in. Um, what do we do with parents that don't fill out their tax forms or don't want to disclose their immigration status? Um, what do we need to do to help them fill out the FAFSA? And this is in the chat if you want to read that. <clears throat> yeah. Unfortunately, if they don't want to provide tax information, a student's only eligible for an unsubsidized loan. And so unless they unless they provide it then then yeah there's not a whole lot they can do so just hurting the student by not doing that or also if they just don't want to sign the FAFSA or they did not file taxes in that year 
then the student is not eligible for any uh, federal financial aid except for uh, subsidized loans. Yeah. And, and one thing to note as well, I was actually doing a little bit of research on this yesterday, but uh, with that, like if, you know, if a student's in a situation with a parent that isn't planning on filing and, you know, they're in like, a, in, you know, which can be an unfortunate situation for the student, the, the, the federal rate for those unsubsidized loans and like the loans that they offer is significantly lower than that of a private, private lender. So that, that's something good to note as well that they can that they can still receive that aid and that you know that student loan is still an option to them if it's needed um, another question came in but what if the parent is not working and then did not file taxes and i might be able to answer that um saying so, you know, i might have to step out um so with that specific situation where that you um there, you can double check the publication 17 from the IRS. They have a little table on there. I think it's table 1-1 or something as such. I think it's on page nine or so, where you can view if the parents are technically required to file taxes or not, because there is a tax, um, uh, you know, a, 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 max, a minimum, I guess, that they have to make in order to file taxes. So if they're making less than that, then technically they don't have to. They may, for verification processes, uh, may have to provide a letter from the IRS stating that they do not need to file taxes, but um, there's some information about that. And I will get the link for that in just a moment. Yeah. And then I've uh, got another question here. It says, has anyone had an issue with the FSA ID not working if both phone and email are unverified? If so, what do we do in this situation? Mom forgot her phone. We verified by email, but could not move forward. Yeah, so it, previously, to my understanding in previous years, it was only required uh, to have one of them, but it sounds like a lot of people are having issues where they have to have both of them in order to proceed forward uh, with the FAFSA this year. Yeah. So it can it can create a tricky situation, but yeah, they, in that situation, if they're if it's not letting them go through, um, yeah. So if you you can either not enter a phone number, but if it's still letting you proceed, then in that situation, you would just have to tell them like, yeah, you may just need to to go grab it and then finish finish the FSID with it. If you've been watching the chat, I dropped that publication 17 in there and it's on page seven of the document. Um, and just a reminder with all of this, uh, there's so many awesome federal work study opportunities when filling out from the FAFSA. Um, Christian right here is one of our examples of federal work study. He's doing some amazing stuff um, and it, it's, it, it's a great place to be able to get some networking opportunities um, with the college. Um, I did some federal work study in my college as a um, teacher's assistant, and or I was able to help two of my professors with research and with their different um, classes, grading, et cetera. So it was awesome to be able to get connected in that department. So if you have students that are like, I'm not sure if I should do the fast, so that's a good thing to kind of mention. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you don't feel like you had your, your question answered, or if you sent a question in early and it didn't get answered, um, let us know. We'd be happy to answer that. Um, and we'll try to see if we can answer any of those questions post this event. But um, yeah, I think we're good with questions or Q&A. So back to you, Christian. Yeah. Yeah, thank you all so much for attending. And we know that you all have busy days ahead. So good luck with everything that you got going on. And especially with the Opportunity Scholarship deadline, we hope that this could be beneficial with helping students get the fastest submitted in time for that.